the east of Kenya's capital, Nairobi, lies Dandora, Kayole, Kariobangi, Jericho, Buruburu, Tena, and Umoja. An expansive array of residential estates which collectively go by the simple name Eastlands. Eastlands, home to a quarter of Nairobi's three million people, is a tale of great and not so great stories. It is, simply told, the pulse of a nation. Here, the struggle of the Kenyan youth is epitomized. In Umoja Estate, we meet 25-year-old David Wandera. David and his brothers run a small outfit that fixes electrical appliances and does domestic installations. And while his business harbors dreams of big success, for now, he is barely making ends meet. Maybe let's say you charge him maybe 10,000 shillings. And I want to make money come out of Plus, where I'm paying him many more views to have. At the end of the day, I'm not part of paying him. Out of 10,000 shillings, I'm making only shillings. Me atano, me atano. And this income is irregular. A story replicated not only among youth in Eastlands, it is a national concern. At the end of the day, it's a battle to buy food, clothing, and most critical, shelter. Kama mimi naishi kwa nyumba ya bedroom moja, kachoka kameshikana na bathroom na jikoni tu. Na nalipishwa 9k per month hii ni moja. So, ukichukua 9k minus from let's say 15, I have 6 6000 shillings to operate. For David and other youth like him who have not secured formal employment, every day is a race to beat a 30-day time bomb. Rent. Unapata kazi anafanya mimi kwa mwisho wa mwezi, hata sio mwisho wa mwezi. Per day maybe ni kitu 100 na watoto wanasoma, majukumu kuvaa manguo kwa lisha nini unaona? Sasa hizo manyumba mzuri ama za kujengwa vizuri unapata ni za wadosi. So it, it's hard for people, especially in Eastern. Ngumu kabisa. Watu wanaishi huku lakini people are suffering. And the dream he pursues seems locked beyond his reach. This is his perspective of Eastlands. Perhaps unknown to him is the fact that this, his field of struggle, was once the housing landmark in independent Kenya. At Kenya's independence, the National Housing Corporation became the government's main agency through which public funds for low-cost housing would be channeled to local authorities. Several estates in Nairobi and across major towns in Kenya bear witness to this golden era. National Housing Corporation, in partnership with local councils, led to Buruburu, Shaurimoyo, Jamhuri, Onyonka, Uhuru, and Olympic estates. Ngara used to be a marvelous place, a good place to live. In fact, it was the best place, especially the city council's houses. We used to have a playing ground for the children. The houses used to be painted. And occasionally they used to come and uh, spray them for any insect or whatever. Tulikuwa barabara hii ilikuwa kukikanyanga rami hapa baka town. Site and service schemes gave birth to Umoja, Dandora, projects that were replicated across major towns like Mombasa, Magongo and Changamwe, Eldoret, Kitale's Milimani, Kisumu City's Milimani, among other towns. The government, on the other hand, provided housing to civil servants. But something changed in the 1970s. The initial plan was for the corporation to channel funds into council housing projects, after which the local councils would remit rents from council houses back to the NHC. This would then form a capital base for further housing development schemes. The funds that were supposed to be rolled on into extra funding, then you, I mean, into extra projects, then cut. Because the money were not coming back to NHC. The NHC has paid off, but we are not realizing the money that are, 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 are supposed to then go into the other projects. The government's role in housing was also thinning. The government was remitting less to the Ministry of Housing. Donor interest was low. Up to the 70s, we were very active in delivery of housing from the public sector side. 
the 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 the, the exchequer um, experience challenges in terms of coping with the demand for these resources. People were moving to cities in search of jobs. From the 5% who lived in towns at Kenya's independence, the country was now looking at over 30% of its citizens living in towns. That is over 12 million people. Demand for housing had radically outstripped supply. Poor governance led to the near collapse of parastatal institutions, including National Housing Corporation. The houses started decaying. Even if something is wrong, you go and report, there was nothing which is done about it. And we were surprised that even they are even increasing rent, and yet there's nothing which has been done. Low-cost housing looked far-fetched. The last amount of money here was received in 1998. Since 1998, there's been no money funded through the exchequer coming through the housing fund on an annual basis for us to do the housing. With the decline in public housing, the private sector took charge. Previously, private housing developers worked largely in the high end of the market, servicing a small but growing middle class of non-civil servants. The private sector housing boom began to take shape with both positive and negative results. The real impact of this is that we are seeing housing being supplied only for that market which can afford, and the market that needed some support mechanism to, to access housing is, uh, is left out. And pushing then the prices of what would have naturally looked a low-income house to become middle income or even high income sometimes, depending on the location and the proximity to the, to the city centre or to services. By 2009, the estimates paint a dire situation. Kenya has a backlog of two million houses yet to build. Rural urban migration is one obvious contributor to what is now a full-blown housing crisis. The cost of uh or putting up a building is very high, and that's why a lot of Kenyans cannot afford. This hardware owner in Komarok knows firsthand the difficulty in trying to construct a house. Like somebody wants to, to construct a house uh, with the, he, he started with the, maybe three million, he had three million to put up a house. But at the end of the, of the work, he's spending a lot of money. But some are not, able to finish in time because of uh, changing costs. Most of the materials in the building industry are supplied by two or three uh, suppliers. So you actually find three MDs or three CEOs sitting over a cup of tea and deciding what is the, the cost of a certain material. Demand your housing and supplying your housing. Mepanda bay ya hizi vitu zikapanda sana. Hata materials. Napata tokenda kwa adwea, material imepanda. Na inapanda karibu each and every week, ama wiki moja, ama wiki mbili. Ukienda kunua chuma flani, wiki ngini ukienda kutafuta hiyo chuma, unapata bei yake ime, imepanda. There is a cartel-like behavior, right? So we need to look at these companies and the profits they make and whether these profits are justified. Uh, we talk about um, electric cables, two, three companies. We talk about cement, we talk about glass, we talk about, uh, about block boards, joinery materials. There is a cartel-like behavior. The big developers are not having it easy either. They too are complaining about how long it takes to roll out substantial housing projects. It doesn't make business sense to the developer. It doesn't make business sense to the people who are then putting up the units. Uh, if you look at the factors that affect pricing, uh, land being on top of it, uh, the cost of materials being another, infrastructure being the next. If you can't build, you have to buy, either cash or mortgage. Mrs. Barongo, a school librarian, is a proud homeowner in Buruburu Estate. She has recently completed financing a 20-year mortgage arrangement. This was not easy because uh, it was a mortgage which turned out to be really very expensive. Uh, in the beginning it was, it was okay, but later on, you know, the, the interest kept on going up and it turned out to be very expensive. There's a problem with the mortgage industry. The first person who comes in is the land buyer or the land owner. 
This landowner is selling today his property to 300%, which has appreciated. The developers are making 100% profit. The banks are charging between 50 to 100%, including the mortgage company. I mean, God bless you if you're just earning a salary and you're going to fund all those profits. For the majority, though, the costs and the long-term commitments are out of their range. For many, there is only one reality, renting. And the costs are still prohibitive. If somebody is a Bulani, you're earning about 40,000, and you're staying because of the family, of the, because of the family, you're staying in a house of paying about 19 or 20,000, then these other things, the balance on any after maybe subtraction of your you, you circle dues and other things, you, your balance could be only be 10,000, and another 10,000 cannot sustain you to the next month. The situation in Buruburu and Umoja is replicated across the country. In the leafy suburb of Hurlingham, the landscape and the figures are 